Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome again to our service this morning. It's lovely to be uh, here again to worship, and uh, I just got to say how much I miss being at the church. I miss seeing you all, and I'm looking forward very much as the numbers go down to the news we're going to get one of these days to tell us we can go back to worshiping together in the little building on Herald Road. And in between then, just know that uh, the elders, all of us are praying for you and, and uh, we're here if you need help. And we pray that you'll reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to just chat with you if you need it. Uh, we are making the effort to call around and talk to people as much as we can. Um, only so many we can get to, but uh, please do feel free to call us. A reminder also of the bulletin that was on the, in the uh, email and should be on the website by now. And so you can follow along uh, in the sermon in just a few moments. Let's take time this morning uh, before we open the Word of God to pray together. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we just come before you again this morning to give thanks. To give thanks, O oh God, for the saints and the brethren at Noble Park Evangelical Baptist Church. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the salvation that we as a church together enjoy and know. Father, we thank you for the work of grace that has been done in the lives of so many uh, of your people who are gathered to worship as part of Noble Park Evangelical Baptist Church. And Father, we give thanks that the work is still going on. The gospel is still being proclaimed despite the lockdowns and all of the troubles with in our, in our country, in the nation, around the world, Lord, the gospel is still being preached. And Father, we thank you that heaven and earth may pass away, COVID may come and go, nations rise and nations fall, kings come and go, rulers come and grow, but the word of our God stands and abides forever. The gospel message stands and abides forever. And Father, we thank you this morning for such a great hope that we have in Christ. Father, we would think about those who are weary and toiling and struggling, Father, with their walk because of the separation, because of loneliness, because of loss. Father, many are fearful and worried because of loss of job and loss of uh, place and circumstance. And Father, we just ask you for them all, that you would encourage them, strengthen them, O oh God, for the journey. Father, we pray that as we consider the scriptures this morning. Father, we pray that you would cause hope to rise in their hearts. Father, help them to turn their eyes off of the circumstances, off of what's happening in our communities and in our nation. And Father, to place our eyes fully and firmly on Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We worship you, O God, this morning for the Savior we have in Christ. Father, we want to say again that we love him who first loved us, even to the point of death, death on a cross. Father, we thank you for the fact that he humbled himself and was willing to become a man, to take on human flesh. Father, to walk this earth with his glory laid aside, and Father, to speak words of life and love and hope, but also to proclaim the gospel of repentance and faith for salvation. Father, we thank you that the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. And Father, we pray this morning that as we would open the scriptures, we would examine them. Father, we pray that his, his name would be honored and revered and lifted up. Father, we pray that we would rejoice in a great hope this morning. And Father, we ask you for these things. We plead with you, O God, for your help. Father, we pray that you would take, take the words and use them, Father, to cause life. Father, we pray that you would cause new life, Father, this morning in the hearts of of some who are listening. Father, we give thanks for the church that is listening, but Father, we ask also for those who are not yet believers, who have stumbled across this video, who are maybe sitting in a family group watching, maybe, Father, with friends watching, and somehow they've come into contact with this message. Father, we know it's by the work of the Holy Spirit in them to bring them into contact with the gospel. Father, we plead with you that you would, like you did with Lydia all those years ago, you would open their hearts to understand the message, to believe in God and know what it is to be saved. Father, we ask you these things, giving thanks and praising your most holy name. 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, take your Bibles again into the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, and I know that Sebastian has read the text for us, but this morning I just want to read again verses 3 and 4, um, 3 and 4 of 1 Peter chapter 1, and the Word of God says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter is writing his letter to a people just like us. They're living with suffering that's associated with belonging to Christ. They, and perhaps us too, are facing real persecution for our faith. And Peter's letter and message is truly an appropriate one for us living in our day and under our circumstances. We are in a mess in this country and around the world because of many things, including COVID-19. And there are still more tough times coming our way. We as believers in Christ need to be encouraged and prepared to face these coming difficulties. As God's beloved adopted family, we have the greatest hope possible. Despite the difficulties and persecution that's coming our way, our hope is only because of God's work of salvation in us. God began this great work in us. God gave us a living hope. God promised us an inheritance. God is preserving us to the end, and God will finish the work that He began. Praise God for such truth. The last week, as we began this message, we said that, first of all, we are to praise God who has chosen us. We have a great hope because God chose us according to His purposes. We were chosen in agreement with the Father's foreknowledge. We're chosen through the Spirit's sanctifying work. And we're chosen to be obedient to God's will and word in the Bible. And we're chosen to be included in Christ's new covenant relationship. Secondly, we saw that we are to praise God who has caused our new birth. God alone can cause all who were spiritually dead, to be born again. God caused us to be born again in agreement with His mercy. God caused us to be born again uh, by joining us together with Christ, together in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. God caused us to be born again into a living hope or to live in hope. And God has promised us an inheritance. Now today, I want us to think and to hope, or think about, sorry, the hope of our inheritance. And I've got an outline, and you can see it on that email, or perhaps in the description below in this video, you'll see there five things. Don't be afraid. Five things. Our inheritance is or was promised. Secondly, our inheritance was promised purchased. Thirdly, our inheritance is perpetual. Fourthly, our inheritance is prepared. And fifthly, our inheritance is protected. And we're going to hopefully look at all five of those this morning. I don't know about you, but I think we all, when we hear about an inheritance that's coming our way, there rises in our hearts a sense of expectancy and hope. And that's exactly what Peter is trying to do with these as he writes. He's giving them the real, sure, concrete, biblical truth of hope that we have because of Christ. Well, first of all, our inheritance was promised. Our inheritance was promised. How do we get to receive this inheritance from God? Our inheritance is first mentioned with the Old Testament promises to Abraham. 
In Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, God promised Abraham with an oath an inheritance, and that included a nation, and then nations, great name, sons, land, and blessing. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I don't have COVID. It's all right. Uh, in Exodus is the story of Abraham's descendants, the nation of Israel, being redeemed by God out of slavery in Egypt, and then their journey through the wilderness to the inheritance in the promised land. The book of Joshua then records the conquest and the distribution of the inheritance of the 12 tribes of Israel. If you'll notice, Israel was redeemed out of slavery into their inheritance. In 1 Peter 1 verse 4, we were born again into an inheritance. We have been redeemed, rescued, and saved, and given an inheritance. In many ways, our life in this world is a walk through the wilderness uh, wastelands, if you like, of this world, looking forward to the inheritance that's laid out before us. Back into the, the story of Israel. Unfortunately and sadly, Israel repeatedly broke God's law and God's covenant, and that led to their final expulsion from the land. But before they were expelled and towards the end of Israel's time in the land, some prophets began to preach a promise of God that a righteous remnant would inherit the world as an everlasting possession. If you were to go to Psalm 2 and verse 8 and Isaiah 54 and verse 3 and Amos 9 verse 11 to 12, not to mention Daniel 7 and verse 14, you can see a little bit of that description of the inheriting, them inheriting the world as an everlasting possession. But God expelled and exiled Israel for disobedience and covenant breaking. They would return after 70 odd years, but not to their own kingdom, but rather to a land always occupied by others, other powers, Persians and Greeks and Romans, with the short exception of the Maccabees when they reigned. But between Malachi and Matthew, the writers who were not sacred inspired writers, but still, historians and writers within Judaism increasingly saw two different categories of people identified. There was the redeemed who would inherit the world or eternal life. And then there was the condemned who would not inherit eternal life. Then we arrive in the New Testament, and the word inheritance is referenced and associated with three key players in the New Testament. We have, first of all, Christ, and secondly, we have Abraham, and thirdly, we have the Christian, us. The promise to Abraham that began in the Old Testament is now broadened to include the whole world. Paul writes in Romans 4.13, that Abraham was promised that he would be the heir of the world. In the New Testament, of course, Christ is the focal point of everything. Now, in the whole Bible, he is the focal point of everything, but in the New Testament, uh, as much the same, I should say. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, we see there that Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. In Galatians 3.16, he is the offspring and descendant of Abraham. In Hebrews 1 and verse 2, we see there that he is the heir, H-E-I-R, heir of all things. In Hebrews 1 verses 3 to 5, he is the enthroned son and heir. He is the focus of all God's kingdom promises and announcements in the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke and so on. Christ is as God's son received the inheritance from his father. Now, to bring it back to us in 1 Peter chapter 1, we can see there that God has chosen us in 1 Peter 1 verse 1. God has caused us to be born again in 1 Peter 1 and verse 2. 
God has adopted us into his family. And Peter doesn't discuss that, but Paul does in Romans 8, 15 and Galatians 4, 5 and Ephesians 1, verse 5. God has adopted us into his family. We who believe in Christ are God's adopted legitimate sons and daughters. And God has given us an inheritance along with Christ, who is the heir of all things. God has promised an inheritance alongside every other person who believes in God with faith like Abraham had. And my friend Connie, he loves to make that statement. But do you believe? Do you believe what God has promised? Do you like Abraham, believe. Do we really truly believe so that it has changed our lives? Real, genuine belief in God, real, genuine trust in God will change our lives as surely as it changed Abraham's and as surely as it changed all those New Testament saints. If we believe in God, trusting Him like Abraham, then we can know for sure that we have an inheritance with Christ. It was promised to Abraham in the Old Testament. It was promised to Christ in the New. And it's promised to us who, like Abraham, believe in God. Praise God for such a great hope we have. The, the inheritance that we have, our inheritance, was first of all promised. Well, one of the questions that often comes up in the reading of a will and discussing of inheritance is, what is it that we inherited? What is our inheritance? Well, secondly, we can see our inheritance was purchased. Our inheritance was purchased. In Hebrews 1 verse 14, the Bible says, and they, that's angels, are not, oh, sorry, are they, which the angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those, listen, who are to inherit salvation. We are the inheritors of the salvation which Christ has purchased. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9 in the NASB, the Bible says that they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Christ shed his blood to pay for my sin and our sin, to set us free from having to pay for it with our own eternal death. Christ purchased the salvation that we are to inherit. Salvation is to be, it means to be rescued from an impending doom. What's that? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10 that God's wrath is still to come. It's the God's wrath which is to come. In 1 Peter 1 verse 5, you'll notice he says we're being guarded for a salvation ready to be revealed. God's wrath against the wicked is yet to be revealed in the future. Matthew 25, if you read all those verses 31 to 46, it describes that future salvation from God's wrath. And in that passage, you'll see that Christ will be seated on his throne and Christ will gather all the nations before him, billions and billions of people. Christ will separate the righteous from the wicked. The wicked, sorry, the wicked will be cursed and cast into the eternal fire. That's God's righteous, just indignation and wrath against the wicked. But the righteous who are gathered to Christ's right hand, his right hand, they will be saved from God's wrath in hell. Christ will save the righteous from destruction. Christ's death in the past has saved us and he will save us. Like we said last week, he has saved us, he is saving us, and he will save us. We as believers in Christ have a great and a lasting hope that when we stand before Christ, 
who is seated as judge and king and executioner, he will save us. The ungodly, the ungodly and unbelieving will be terrified at Christ's coming, but we'll be overjoyed because in that final moment, he will save us. That final salvation is future oriented and that's why faith is involved. We will inherit salvation from God as rightful heirs with Christ. Our inheritance of salvation was purchased by God. Praise God. That's what Peter is saying here. Blessed be God. Praiseworthy be God who has done all these things. And our inheritance is, uh, our, inheritance is our salvation which was purchased by Christ. Praise God for such a salvation and such a great hope. Thirdly, then, you'll notice our inheritance is perpetual. And I have to apologize for the alliteration, but I was trying to find a way to make it memorable. And with five points, that's important. Our inheritance was promised. It was purchased by Christ, and it was also perpetual. Peter, no doubt, remembered Jesus' words in Matthew 19 and, and verse 29. He said that those who have left home and family and possessions for his sake will inherit eternal life. Now, Peter's original recipients in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and uh, Bithynia and Asia and so on, they were probably those who had already lost family and houses and lands. They were, in a very real sense, exiles for Christ. And their earthly inheritance in their time was tied to lands and houses and farms and so on. And so Peter, by telling them of their inheritance that they have in Christ, is imparting to them a great hope. Peter gives them great encouragement when he says, They have an inheritance with God, and their inheritance from Jesus' words is eternal life. It is perpetual life. Now, not only did that word work for the alliteration purposes, which does help, it also conveys a great truth. If I inherit from my dad, uh, whatever I inherit from my dad, if I inherit from my dad, I don't get to keep it. It is not mine forever. It's passed on to my son and my sons in the forms of, form of cash and properties, etc., but when we inherit from God, our Heavenly Father, it is eternal life from God. It is ours perpetually. It is ours forever. It's an eternal life. But that's just one aspect of it. The life we inherit is life without end. It's perpetual. It's eternal. But it's so much more than just unending. Don't ever think, well, you can, but don't stay in the idea that eternal life is just an unending existence. It is life to its fullest, highest, sweetest experience and enjoyment. United with Christ, chosen and adopted and made alive by God our Father, we have the absolute essence and enjoyment of life. Psalm 16, verse 11. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures pleasures forevermore. We inherit eternal life from God, the author of life, as Acts 3.15 calls him. We may lose houses and lands and possessions and freedoms and more. We may lose our temporal life to persecution, but we have an inheritance of God, from God of abundant, eternal, joyful life. We will need a glorified heavenly body fitly designed and built to allow us to experience the indescribable, incomprehensible life yet to come. What did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. The heart of man cannot even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. It's life, eternal, perpetual life. And my question, of course, is do you have it? 
Is that eternal life that God promised as inheritance, is it yours? In John 3, 16, and in my own paraphrase, would say like this, For God loved the world in this way. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting, eternal, perpetual life. The hope of eternal life. That's what our inheritance is. Praise God for such a great inheritance. Praise God for the hope that we have that this life, this body that's breaking down and falling apart. I just got three, three pairs of glasses this week because my eyes aren't working the way they're supposed to. And, and all these things are falling apart, but we look forward in great expectation and great hope to the fact that we are inheriting eternal life. Which brings us to the fourth one. Our inheritance is prepared. And our inheritance is even more than just eternal life. And that's wonderful in itself. It was, our inheritance was promised to Abraham and promised again through Christ. Our inheritance is our salvation purchased with Christ's blood. Our inheritance is perpetual eternal life. It is also the kingdom of God prepared for us from the foundations of the earth. If you remember Matthew 25 and verse 34, we, we mentioned that reference earlier, talking about Jesus and the salvation that we are going to experience. In that passage, after the wicked have been cursed and cast away from God into eternal fire, the Bible says the king will turn to those who have been declared righteous and he will say, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If being chosen was enough for us to have hope, and it certainly is, and if being caused to be born again wasn't enough to give us hope, if being adopted wasn't enough, if inheriting blood-bought salvation wasn't enough to give us hope, if inheriting eternal life, if all these things were not enough to give us hope, then consider this. We are to inherit the kingdom from God, our Father and the King. What does that mean? It means we have an accepted place in the kingdom of God. If you go to Revelation chapter 1, verses, uh, the end of verse 5 and verse 6, it says this, To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And he's cause he's speaking about Christ. The wonderful truth here is this inheritance of a kingdom is not an afterthought. God always had it in mind to make and include us in his kingdom. God prepared his kingdom for us to occupy before the foundation of the world, before he created the universe, before man sinned and fell, before we were born or had done anything good or evil, before we had heard the gospel or even believed, God had prepared a kingdom for us. We have eternal life in God's kingdom as God's priests and kings. Revelation 20 verse 6 displays something of it. He says, Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over the second death, sorry, over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. If you notice the verb tenses there in Revelation 1 verse 6, he has made us a kingdom. That's past tense. In Revelation 20 verse 6, we will reign with him. It's in the future tense. Now some of us see that as already happening. That's great. That's okay. No problem. Whichever way you see it, God bless you, don't miss the main point. We have a great hope and expectation of receiving a great inheritance from God, our Heavenly Father. We have this inheritance because of God's work. 
It's not our doing. We have no right reason to boast. Think of the massive grace of God that has brought such a salvation to us and given us such an amazing inheritance that we can hope and expect it. God shows us from before the foundation of the world. God prepared a kingdom for us from before the foundation of the world. Christ suffered on a cross to purchase our salvation. Christ suffered and rose again to give us eternal life. Christ has, sorry, God has caused us to be born again to live in hope. God has adopted us and given us an inheritance. And that inheritance is salvation from God's wrath. That inheritance is eternal life in God's presence. That inheritance is a place in a kingdom to reign with Christ. And we can see right away that God is our inheritance. Christ is our inheritance because everything we have as an inheritance is all wrapped up in Him. So our inheritance was promised it was purchased. It was, uh, what was the next P? I've actually lost my thought. It was uh, prepared, and now it's protect protected. I probably should have picked a different letter than P because I'm going to stumble over the P. Five, fifth point here, our inheritance is protected. And we look at this very briefly. Notice what Peter says in the last phrase of Peter 1 and verse 4. He talks about this inheritance which is kept in heaven for you. Kept or protected is another word that can be translated there. By God for us. Everything in our world that we can experience within our view and experience is in a state of constant decline. The older I get, the more I'm declining, as I mentioned with my eyes. But notice the general state of our inheritance that is kept by God. He says in verse 4 there that it's imperishable. It means it cannot be touched or influenced by death and decay. Everything around us, including us from the moment of birth or beginning, is already in the process of dying. It has entered the process of death. Everything in our world, in context, is subject to death and decay, except, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he had no sin, and therefore death had no hold on him. That's why he could rise again from the grave on the third day. Our inheritance is, secondly, undefiled, and that means it can't be touched by sin or evil. Everything around us is touched by sin and evil. All of creation groans under the influence of sin and death. Even we who have been set free from the power of sin are still living in the presence of it. We're influenced by it, but not our inheritance. Our inheritance is undefiled. All of creation is influenced by sin and evil, except the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he took our sin on himself and bore it in his own body on the cross. He endured the, the wrath of God, excuse me, in our place. And the sin had that influence him on that sense, but he had no sin of his own. And even though he was tempted just as we are, yet it was without sin. Our inheritance is thirdly unfading. It's unfading, meaning it's untouchable by time. Even the most pure, the most clean, the most protected, brightest, shiniest object over time will begin to fade. I was watching some scenes uh, from inside Chernobyl and, and Pripyat, which is the little city close by Chernobyl. And you know, the city has been left virtually untouched by the outsiders in 30 plus years since that terrible, terrible accident. And all those things in that city, this, this beautiful city, it was described as a, as a paradise. It was a beautiful city. They'd all broken down and rust and moth and decay and corrosion had begun to creep in and the forest and the land around was slowly reclaiming the city and all the paint was peeling and everything was rusting. It was all just corroding and coming apart. But you know, our inheritance, says Peter, is kept and protected unfading. It will never fade. Think about this, brothers and sisters, the hope we have. It's our salvation will never decay. 
It will never be defiled. It will never fade away. Our eternal life in Christ, the essence, the sweetness, the the ultimate existence of life that anybody can ever experience is eternal life in Christ. It will never decay. It will never be defiled. It will never, ever fade. Think about our place in God's kingdom. Never subject to death, evil, or time. It's all there, protected by God for us. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. The last thing I really want to share with you, just as we close, is this. The great encouragement in all of this is this. Unlike an inheritance from my earthly parents or grandparents, we're not waiting until they die for us to experience it. We live, even now, in a limited, partial experience of all those things. Ephesians 1, verse 14 tells us that we've received the indwelling Holy Spirit as a deposit or guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the full possession of it. It's like when you, you make a deposit on a house, you put down some money to save it, and then and you start paying it off. The deposit guarantees that they won't sell it to somebody else. So God has given us a deposit in the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit within us and His work in and on us to transform us into Christ-likeness is like a reassuring, continual reminder, the best is yet to come. That's grounds for hope, brothers and sisters. Having the Spirit within is a constant source of hope to keep going in this life, no matter what the difficulties, no matter what the sufferings, no matter what persecution may come and what it may bring. Having the Spirit within us testifying to our hearts that we belong to God. There is inheritance coming our way. We keep going. Romans 5 verse 5, Paul writes and says that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 15, 13, same book, same author. Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you, we may abound in hope. The Holy Spirit is a living, powerful, powerful, influencing reason for hope. One day, brothers and sisters, faith will give way to sight. We will see Christ, but We have salvation right now, already from the wrath of God. And one day we will see and experience the full exercise of it when we are there in that day, separated to Christ, on his right hand, sorry, as his sheep, delivered from the wrath of God by eternal fire. In other words, we have salvation right now. We experience something of it, but we're going to see the full exercise of it in a day to come. We have eternal life right now, already. And we will have the fullest experience of it, the essence of it, when we are face-to-face with Christ, experiencing the fullness of joy and God's pleasures forevermore. We are already, right now, in the kingdom, working and serving as kings and priests. And yet, we will, in a coming day, have the full experience of it when we are present with Christ. So what do we do with all this? So we wrap it up. What do we do with all this? From verse 6, we rejoice in the hope of our inheritance. Like we were singing earlier, we hold fast to Christ and the fact that He is holding us fast enables us to carry on because in Christ alone there is hope. We trust God and we carry on. We praise God who was worthy to be praised for such a great salvation, for such a great inheritance, for such a great hope. That's the hope we have. To read it again, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, 
He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this, we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, we've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of our faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we have a great hope. Whatever suffering we're enduring because of Christ, because we name the name of Christ, because we belong to Him, we have a hope that's so much more and so much greater whatever persecution we may endure in days to come. And it's not hard to see, looking around, to see how our culture and our world and even our government is turning increasingly against Christ and against Christianity. We have a hope. And so, like Peter says in Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 12, I believe it is, he, he says to the believers... By, Phil, by Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. And then his final command, stand firm in it. Stand firm, brothers and sisters. But you know, as, as the time winds down and it's slipping away, I just want to take a few moments to talk to those who don't know Christ. Maybe you're sitting here listening to this and watches thinking, hey, do I have an inheritance? Is, is that for me? Is that possible for me? Well, to go back to that verse I read earlier, that probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible, uh, in all the world, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That's part of that inheritance. If you're listening to this, know for certainty that God created you for a relationship with Himself. Know for a certainty that God created you to glorify Him in everything you do and simultaneously have the greatest joy, the greatest of the essence of life as you glorify Him in all that you do. But the problem is, as we all know, sin has crept in. We were born in sin. We like to commit sin. We commit sin because it's our nature and it's something we love doing. We have no desire for God, but by God's doing, you're sitting there watching this and listening to what I'm saying. By God's doing, He has brought you into contact with Christianity, with Bible, with Bible verses, with the truth of the gospel. And He's working to open your heart and your mind to hear the message of the gospel, to trust in Christ to know what it is to be forgiven of sin, to be set free from the power of sin, to be set free one day from the presence of sin. And He's going to fill you with His Holy Spirit as a deposit, like we just said, as a guarantee of the salvation that's, that's coming, the guarantee of the inheritance, the full possession of that inheritance that's coming. So I urge you, I plead with you with all my heart, Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Know what it is to be forgiven and saved. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you and we praise you again for the word of the living God. Father, we thank you for such a great inheritance. It was promised to Abraham, promised to Christ, and promised to us. Father, we thank you that it was purchased. Our salvation was purchased by Christ. Father, we thank you that our salvation is eternal life, perpetual life, but the sweet essence of life. And Father, we thank you that our inheritance was prepared by you, a kingdom prepared before the foundation of the earth. Father, we thank you for the deposit that you have given to each one of us, the Spirit of God to live in us, to testify of who you are, to preach and teach the truth to us, to open our eyes to see the way that we should go as we read the Scriptures and to walk in it. Father, to change us, to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for 
the deposit, which is the Holy Spirit indwelling us and filling us. Father, we pray for those who are struggling and downcast, who are wrestling with, with all that's happening with COVID, with isolation, with loneliness, with bereavement from loss of loved ones, with struggle and fear and anxiety from loss of job and loss of uh, certain circumstances. Father, we just cry out to you for them, that you would strengthen them for the journey. Father, you pray, we pray that you would lift their gaze to see Jesus, to fasten their eyes, to reach out like Paul said, no, the he writer of Hebrews said, to lay hold of the anchor of our souls, a sure and a steadfast anchor. Father, we pray that we would hold on to Christ. And Father, we give thanks. We praise you, O God, that he is holding fast to us. We thank you again, O God, for this time in the word, for our worship together. And we ask you, Lord, for your blessing as we close. In Jesus' name, amen.